Hello everybody. Welcome to NEET Crash Course Biology. Now we are going to discuss about the synopsis of two chapters. The first chapter that we will be discussing is body fluids and circulation. Now you know that body fluids are very necessary to distribute nutrients, to distribute respiratory gas and also to eliminate excretory products in the body. If you look at some of the lower forms of organisms like for example in arthropods they have an open type of circulatory system where they do not have closed channels or blood vessels. Blood flows freely in their body cavity and they also don't have pigments in their blood and their blood is colorless and is referred to as hemolymph. But here in this chapter we are mostly going to focus on the human body fluid and circulation in which you know that we have two types of body fluids. One is called the blood which is red in color and one is the lymph that is colorless and you know that blood in your body flows through closed channels which are referred to as arteries, veins and capillary. As a result we say that our circulatory system is a closed type of circulatory system. Now what is blood basically made up of? Now all of you should remember that blood has two major components. One is referred to as the plasma and one is referred to as the formed element or the cells. Now plasma makes up uh, about 55% uh, of the blood and cells make up about 45% of the blood. Okay, And in the plasma you have 92% of plasma is nothing but water and the remaining 6 to 8% of plasma is nothing but the protein so it is important to know that six to eight percent of plasma is proteins among these proteins some of the important proteins are the fibrinogen now the fibrinogen helps in blood clotting okay and then you have albumin the albumin maintains the salt concentration in the blood it maintains the ionic balance in the blood and lastly we have uh, or the osmotic balance in the blood so after fibrinogen and albumin we have another blood protein which is very very important which is called the globulin and globulin is what provides immunity to your system now so this is the basic composition of the blood plasma which makes up 55% cells which make up 45% plasma has 92% water 6 to 8% and it is important to remember all the three plasma proteins like fibrinogen albumin and globulin along with their functions if you were to focus on the blood cells you always have to remember that there are three types of blood cells one is referred to as the erythrocytes you all are aware that erythrocytes are nothing but the rbcs and then you have the leukocytes the leukocytes are nothing but the wbcs and lastly we have the platelets now the platelets are technically referred to as the thrombocytes so these are the three major types of blood cells that you will be studying and you have to know what are each of these three blood types are further classified into they are further divided into several important classes. In the next slide you can see the various type of blood cells for example let us start off with the erythrocytes about 5 to 5.5 million erythrocytes are present in our body and you know that RBCs live only for about 120 days and once they are completed they have completed their lifespan they are destroyed in a uh, organ called a spleen which is called uh, the graveyard of the RBC so remember they usually are about 5 to 5.5 million RBCs per millimeter cube of blood and you know that RBCs contain a red colored pigment that is referred to as hemoglobin which help in oxygen transport RBCs are biconcave and disc like and they do not have a nucleus at maturity so they are basically cells which have lost their nucleus during the early stages of development okay then we can classify wbc's into now all of you remember the wbc's are further classified into two types one is referred to as the granulocytes now granulocytes are those which have granules in their cytoplasm so these three are referred to as the granulocytes because they have as you can see in their cytoplasm there are a lot of granules and the second class of wbc's are called as the a granulocytes they have a smooth cytoplasm, they don't have any uh, granules in their cytoplasm. Lymphocytes and monocytes are the second class of WBCs which are called 
ഈ ഗ്രാൻഡുലോസൈറ്റ്സ് യു ഹാവ് ടു റിമെമ്പർ ദ റിലേറ്റീവ് പ്രൊപ്പോർഷൻ സിക്സ്റ്റി ടു സിക്സ്റ്റി ഫൈവ് പെർസെൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് ദം ഓഫ് ഡബ്ല്യൂ ബി സീസ് ആർ ന്യൂട്രോഫിൽസ് ആൻഡ് യു നോ ദാറ്റ് ന്യൂട്രോഫിൽസ് ഹാവ് വൺ ഫംഗ്ഷൻ ദാറ്റ് ദേ ആർ ഫാഗോസൈറ്റിക് ദ ഈറ്റ് അപ് ദ ജേംസ് ബൈ ഫാഗോസൈറ്റോസിസ് ആൻഡ് ദെൻ യു ഹാവ് ഇയോസിനോഫിൽസ് അബൌട്ട് ടു ടു ഫൈവ് പെർസെൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് ദ ഡബ്ല്യൂ ബി സീസ് ആർ ഇയോസിനോഫിൽസ് ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് വെരി ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് ദാറ്റ് ഇയോസിനോഫിൽസ് ഹെൽപ്പ് യുവർ ബോഡി ഇൻ റെസിസ്റ്റിംഗ് ഇൻഫെക്ഷൻ so let me write they help in resisting infections and most importantly they also help in allergic responses okay and then basophils are about 0.3 to 1% of them are basophils okay very very less in number and these basophils secrete certain chemicals such as histamine all these are involved in uh, inflammatory responses in your body histamine heparin and serotonin are the chemicals secreted by the basophils 20 to 25% of your wbcs are lymphocytes which have a smooth cytoplasm and that's why they are called a granulocytes whereas only 6 to 8% of them are kidney shaped nucleated cells which are called monocytes again monocytes are involved mostly in phagocytosis they are phagocytic in nature lymphocytes as you all know are further into two types the b lymphocytes and the t lymphocytes and basically both of them are involved in immune response so whatever immune responses happen in your body to fight against the foreign agent a pathogenic organism is because of the b and the t lymphocytes and you know about the platelets the thrombocytes there are about 1. uh 3 to about 1.5 lakh 1 lakh 30000 to uh 1 one, 1 one lakh uh sorry yeah there are lakhs of uh, these platelets that are present in your body okay now uh these platelets are mostly derived from special giant cells which are nucleated which are present in your bone marrow and you know the main purpose of the platelets is nothing but blood clotting okay so about 1 lakh to up to about 3 lakh 50000 uh, that is 3.5 lakh platelets are present in your blood now coming to abo blood grouping now in your blood grouping all of you should remember that your blood grouping is based on the type of antigen present on your rbc now if this is your rbc and on the surface of your rbc you have certain uh, glycoproteins or sugars which are nothing but antigens if a person is blood group and before that i also have to tell you that in the plasma you have certain y shaped substances or y shaped now this is for representation purpose only now these substances are referred to as antibodies so remember your blood group is dependent upon what type of antigen you have on your rbc and what type of antibody you have in your plasma okay now for example a person who is blood group a will have let me represent antigen a in the form of a triangle antigen a in his rbc but antibody b so i am going to represent the ends of this fork in a square pattern to show that it is not the same as antigen a so if you have antigen a you will have antibody b you will not have the corresponding antigen and antibody if a person has antigen b on his rbc let me represent it in the form of a cube now i am going to represent the ends of the antibody a in the form of the sharp edges because these are specific to antigen a so a person with blood group b has antigen b but the non corresponding antibody a in his plasma if a person has blood group ab his rbc will have so this is the rbc on the surface of rbc there will be both antigen a as well as antigen b but he will not have any antibodies in his plasma if a person is blood group o he will not have any antigens in his on his rbc but he will have both antibody a as well as antibody b so another question is why can't the person have for example if i have antigen a on my rbc why can't i have antibody a in my plasma imagine if i have the same antigen and the same antibody my own antibody will react with my own antigen and it will cause destruction of my rbc please remember antibodies go and bind to the specific antigens and they form an antigen antibody complex which is very uh, which is actually involved in destruction of the para- uh, pathogenic cells or germs that enter your body so if this were to happen in my system where for example imagine there was an imaginary situation where i had antigen a on my rbc and i had antibody 
A, both are same, remember, I am using the same antigen and antibody. Then this antibody which is specific, see they have shown the ends in the form of uh, triangular so that to show that it is complementary to this triangular antigen A. If this were the case, then the antibody would go and bind to this antigen and it would cause the destruction of my RBC. As a result, all of you should remember one thing. If I have antigen A on my RBC, I will not have antibody A. I will have, say, a different type of antibody. See here, I have shown the ends of the antibody like a square. So to tell you that this cannot go and bind to the antigen, so my RBC is safe. My RBC won't undergo destruction because I have the non-corresponding that is antigen and antibodies, antibody. So always remember if you have a type of antigen on your RBC, you will have the non-corresponding type of the antibody in your plasma. Now later scientists discovered that imagine this is the RBC. Okay, on your RBC, I told you that you may have antigen A and if you have both antigen A and antigen B, then you will belong to a blood group that is blood group AB. But however, surprisingly, scientists discovered there is an additional antigen sitting on your RBC, on some people's RBC and they called this as the RH antigen. Okay, and if this additional antigen is there, I call the blood group as positive. For example, imagine that this is the RBC and I have antigen A and there is RH antigen on the RBC and say there is another person's RBC who has antigen A but there is no RH antigen. So I will call this blood group as A positive. I will call this blood group as A negative. The positive refers to the presence of an additional antigen on the RBC which was discovered in rhesus monkeys and therefore it is named after rhesus rh the rh antigen present on the rbc so not only are there antigen a and antigen b there will be an additional antigen that some people have if they have you will designate them as rh positive if they don't have you will designate them as rh negative there is a peculiar situation seen when the mother is rh negative now imagine that when the mother is rh negative say for example a woman marries a man the woman is rh negative and the man is rh positive now in most cases rh positive and it is a it is a rule that rh positive is dominant so obviously when rh positive in most cases from genetics you might know that the dominance how it expresses itself in most cases the resulting child that is the baby will be rh positive because i told you that the father is rh positive even though the mother is rh negative the father is rh positive and rh positive is a dominant trait i told you okay so here the mother is rh negative but see the baby that is developing inside her womb this is her first pregnancy her first pregnancy is going to be absolutely normal the baby will be healthy, the baby will be born normally, it will be healthy. But what is happening is, there is a, uh, during the childbirth, when the baby is coming out of her system, that is during the delivery time, you know that between the mother and the baby, there is a connection that is called the placenta. The placenta is broken when the baby is coming out. That time, some of the baby's blood will enter into the mother's system. Now, when the baby's blood leaks into the mother's system, well, what will the mother's system be exposed to? The mother's system will be, for the first time, exposed to the RH antigen of the baby isn't it so how did the baby's rbc leak into the mother's system during childbirth during childbirth when the placenta breaks or when the placenta ruptures it is important to note that some of the baby's blood may leak into the mother's system so imagine this is the baby's rbc the baby's rbc has a special antigen on it which is sitting on it which is referred to as the RH antigen. That's why we call the baby as RH positive. 
Now, for the first time, the mother has been exposed to this Rh antigen. And generally, we use the word antigen to anything that is foreign to your body and anything which can trigger the production of antibodies in your body. So she is normally given birth to her child, but she has now become exposed to the child's, to her baby's Rh antigen. So what does she start producing in her blood, in her immune system? Her immune system will start making anti-Rh antibodies. Her immune system will start preparing antibodies against the baby's antigen. Why? Because she is for the first time exposed to the Rh antigen. Because please remember, she herself is Rh negative so her body was for the first time exposed to rh antigen and she will now start preparing anti rh antibodies then can you imagine what will happen during the second pregnancy during the second pregnancy see how many antibodies she has unfortunately these antibodies can cross the placenta and she has her second child developing in her fetus in her womb and the second fetus also happens to be rh positive now the second fetus which has Rh antigen on its RBC, unfortunately from the mother's blood the antibodies are released which will attack, which will come and bind to the Rh antibody, sorry the Rh antigen on the fetal RBC and they will destroy the fetal RBC. So where did this uh, anti-RH antibodies come from? Now these anti-RH antibodies were produced in the mother's body. Okay, so produced in the mother and remember these are called the anti-RH because they are going and binding specifically to the RH factor of the second baby. So these are called the anti-RH antibodies. Now these are the RH antigens which are basically present on the child's RBC. This is the second child. Remember she is pregnant for the second time. Okay, so that time these mother, the mother has produced the anti-RH antibody that goes and attaches, that goes and binds to the RH antigen of the fetus and it will destroy the fetal RBC. And this condition that is seen in the newborn baby where its RBCs are being destroyed at a very rapid rate is referred to as the erythroblastosis fetalis. Okay, so this medical condition where the baby is born with rapidly destructing RBCs is called erythroblastosis fetalis. So the condition for this all of you please remember the mother should be Rh negative, the man, the father should be Rh positive. Why is the first pregnancy normal? Because it was during the first pregnancy that while the child was being delivered that some of the child's RBC leaked into the mother. What did the child RBC uh, have on it? It had Rh antigen. Now the mother was exposed to the Rh antigen for the first time. So antigen is something that is foreign to her. So what does she start making? She starts making anti-RH antibodies and when does it have its effect during her second pregnancy the anti-RH antibodies these anti-RH antibodies which are produced in the mother will penetrate uh, the fetus through the placenta and they will start attacking the RH anti antigen present on the fetal RBC so this is whose RBC this is the RBC of the fetus RBC of the fetus has RH antigen. So the mother's anti-RH antibody attacks the fetal RBC and as a result it will destroy the fetal RBC leading to a medical condition called erythroblastosis fetalis. Okay. Coagulation of blood. Now coagulation is nothing but blood clotting. The first event of blood clotting is nothing but uh, the formation of an enzyme complex that is referred to as the thrombokinase enzyme complex. All of you remember clotting or coagulation of blood. So coagulation refers to clotting. First there should be an injury. Whenever there is an injury, the moment there is tissue death, the platelets will come to that particular site and the platelets will start releasing certain factors. Now these factors that are released by the platelets will result in a series of, will take part in a series of enzyme linked reactions. Alright, so these are the series of enzyme linked reactions and these enzyme linked reactions will result in the formation of the ultimate goal of these enzyme linked reaction is the formation of an enzyme complex that is the, called the thrombokinase. 
now what is this thrombokinase do now this thrombokinase this stable is slightly modified will convert a protein called prothrombin into thrombin and thrombin will in turn convert fibrinogen which is uh, a soluble protein present in the blood into insoluble protein threads which are referred to as fibrin now these fibrin threads will form a meshwork like this they will attach to each other and form a network and this network will plug the wound and it will trap all the blood vessel uh, blood cells in it and it will form a reddish brown scum and this reddish brown scum that prevents your blood loss or bleeding is referred to as clot okay so let us see again first there was an injury then injury led to uh, the movement of platelets to the site of injury they release certain factors the factors bring about a series of enzyme linked reactions which ultimately results in the formation of an enzyme complex called thrombokinase what does thrombokinase do it converts prothrombin into thrombin then what does this thrombin do the thrombin itself acts as an enzyme it will convert fibrinogen spelling is wrong here so fibrinogen is converted to fibrin please remember fibrinogen is soluble whereas fibrin is in the form of insoluble threads okay so fibrinogen which is soluble is converted into insoluble threads called fibrin and these insoluble threads which are called fibrin will organize themselves into a network like structure which will block the part which is injured it will clog or clot the particular bleeding and therefore it will uh, form a seal or a plug it will trap all the blood vessels and the dead cells in and around and therefore it will form a reddish brown substance which is referred to as the clot or the coagulum so this clot is also referred to as the coagulum okay now lymph now lymph is a clear fluid all of you see this is a capillary network now you know that in your body blood is being carried to all your organs through arteries and veins the artery branches into the thinnest artery which is referred to as the arteriole which enters into what is called a capillary network so here you can see the blue and the red structure is the capillary network now as the blood is flowing through the capillary network uh, some of the water and some of the smallest water soluble substances leak into the surrounding space so for example let me draw a simplified version of a capillary here this is an arteriole the arteriole breaks into a capillary network i will show only two branches here very very narrow branches of the capillary system and then it reunites as the venule which enters into uh, it reunites and enters into the venule so blood enters through the arteriole and blood exits the capillary network through the venule while the blood is flowing into the art uh, into the capillary what gets filtered from the wall of the capillary like i said much of the water in the blood and very very small water soluble substances so they get filtered so imagine that they get collected in this space in the space between the capillary network this liquid that gets collected in the space between the capillary network is called as the tissue fluid or it is called the interstitial fluid okay so where did they get filtered from they got filtered from the capillary network and now these cap this this uh, in tissue fluid will enter into a network of very very thin tubes which are referred to as see these green colored tubes over here these are referred to as the lymph capillary so they are taken up by these fine tubes which are also lined with a very thin wall and these are referred to as the lymph capillaries the lymph capillaries will unite to form the lymph vessel more than one lymph vessel will unite to form larger lymph vessel inside the lymph vessel you can see valves like how you see inside your veins so the tissue fluid is being carried inside the smaller lymph vessels the smaller lymph vessels unite together to form the larger lymph vessels and at regular intervals of the larger uh, lymph vessels you have these bean shaped structures which help in filtering the lymph and collecting if the lymph has any pathogens in it it will trap those pathogens these are referred to as the lymph node okay and then you can see that these larger lymph vessels will again uh, merge together to form the broadest of vessels which are referred to as the lymphatic 
ducts from the lymphatic ducts the lymph will get entered the lymph will get drained into the major veins of the body so all of you should remember ultimately the lymph is being sent into the uh, vein and then ultimately it goes back into the heart so that the heart can pump this to the kidney and the kidney can filter the blood free of all these pathogens and waste substances which was collected in the tissue space okay so very important is in the capillary network much of the water and the water soluble proteins what does not come out of the capillary larger proteins and most of your blood cells wbc's may come out but rbc's and all that will remain inside the blood they will enter the venule only water and water soluble proteins will sorry water soluble substances will move into the surrounding space and they will collect in the tissue called as tissue fluid and interstitial fluid and who collects them again these smaller capillaries called lymphatic capillaries the lymphatic capillaries unite so let us label these tiny capillaries as lymph capillary okay these are the ones collecting the tissue fluid and then they become vessels they become smaller vessels smaller vessels unite together to form larger lymph vessels and the larger lymph vessels unite together like it's labeled over here they form something called lymphatic duct and where does the lymphatic duct carry the tissue fluid now you don't call it tissue fluid anymore the fluid that is present inside the lymphatic duct by the time it enters into the lymphatic system you no longer call this fluid as tissue fluid you will call it as the lymph this colorless fluid is the lymph that is sent into your vein specifically there is a vein in your shoulder region that is referred to as the sub clavian vein from where it enters into your superior vena cava and then it drains into the heart the right side of your heart and the heart so it mixes with the blood ultimately the lymph that is collected between the capillary network it is mixing with the blood and this will anyway be sent to the kidney so all the waste substances will be eliminated okay see the simplified version i told you i told you that the fluid gets collected over here water and water soluble substances they are collected by lymphatic capillary and then the lymphatic capillaries unite to form see here these are the smaller lymph vessels these are the larger lymph vessels at regular intervals you have lymphatic nodes which help in filtering the pathogens and destroying them and then they actually become larger called lymphatic ducts i told you many lymphatic vessels unite to form lymphatic duct and see how they are being drained into by now the tissue fluid is called lymph and the lymph is drained into as you can see here the superior vena cava which is entering into the right side of your heart so you all are aware about the structure of the heart now this is the vertical section of the heart the upper chambers are very thin they are referred to as the atria okay there is a left atrium this is the left atrium this is the right atrium and this is your left ventricle and this is your right ventricle and you know that the valves that are present between the atria and the ventricle which i am showing here now it's a tricuspid valve on the right side it's a bicuspid valve on the left side and if you also remember the blood vessel that is emerging from the right ventricle is the pulmonary aorta it is guarded by pulmonary artery it is guarded by uh, the semi lunar valve and the blood vessel which enters which originates from the left ventricle it is not shown here clearly it is the systemic aorta and it is also guarded by the semi lunar valves now how does heart exactly beat now for that we have the conducting system of the heart now in the conducting system of the heart again let us orient the chambers this is the right atrium this is the left atrium this is the left ventricle this is the right ventricle now arising now this is the opening of the superior vena cava this is the superior vena cava just below the opening of the superior vena cava you have a blue colored mass of tissue which is actually specialized muscle fibers it is called the sinew atrial node this sinew atrial node is the tissue which generates electrical signals which is required for your heart to contract so we call the sinew atrial node as the pacemaker 
The electrical signals as you can see which are sent out by the sinoatrial node they reach both the atria and they are picked up by another mass of tissue that is present over here at the lower uh, left corner of the right atrium and this mass of tissue is called the AVN. It is called the atrioventricular node, isn't it? And from the AV node, a bundle is coming down. See, uh, follow the uh, what I am writing here. A bundle comes down. It branches into the right bundle branch. It branches into the left bundle branch, which reach the apex of the heart, which run up the wall of the ventricle and give out fine branches. The fine branches are called the Purkin J fibers. So all of you remember that this bundle that is coming down from the atrioventricular node is referred to as the AV bundle and then the AV bundle branches into the two branches the left bundle branch the right bundle branch and I told you that the smaller fibers in the wall of the ventricle is referred to as the Purkin J fibers this entire system consisting of the left bundle branch the right bundle branch which is the branch of AV bundle and the Purkin J fiber this constitutes what is called the bundle of now what are all these structures now all these structures none of them are nerves they are all special muscle fibers okay and we say that the heart has auto regulation it is auto rhythmic because I told you the special muscle that is sitting on the upper right corner of your right atrium which is the sinoatrial node has the ability to generate its own electrical signals and since the sinoatrial node is not a nerve it is a mass of specialized muscle and this is the first one to generate the signal for heartbeat and that's why we call the human heart as a myogenic heart Myogenic means it is something in which the pacemaker is not made up of neuron. It is made up of a special mass of cardiac muscles. Then where does the signal reach? It reaches the AVN. AVN picks up the signal and AVN sends the signal through the uh, AV bundle here. And then all the way down the signal reaches the bundle, the bundle branches. And then finally it passes to the wall of the ventricle through the Purkin J fibers. That's how the entire heart receives the electrical signals and they start beating in a rhythmic manner. Okay. Cardiac cycle, very simple. Now there is a stage when all the chambers of your heart are in a relaxed state. It is called the diastole. Notice how the, uh, the atrioventricular valves are open and the semilunar valves are closed. Okay. Now this is the time when blood fills the ventricle under the influence of gravity much of the blood enters from the atria into the ventricle why because all the chambers are in a relaxed state so the ventricle gets filled how much of the ventricle gets filled in this case 70 percent of the blood from the atria will automatically enter into the ventricle because the atrioventricular valves are open okay and then after that soon after that you have the contraction of the atria now when the atria undergo contraction the remaining 30 percent of the blood will get pushed into the ventricle from initially 70 percent got pushed now the remaining 70 per 30 percent get pushed because the atria is undergoing contraction again note during the atrial contraction the valves that is the semilunar valve here it is labeled as the mitral valve the bicuspid valve on the left side and the tricuspid valve on the right side are also open now what happens the ventricle is undergoing contraction see the ventricle contracts the atria is relaxing when the ventricle contracts all of you notice the cuspid valves will close why should the cuspid valves close when the ventricles contract so that the blood doesn't go back into the atria but which valve is open now the semilunar valves are open why should the semilunar valves open so that blood from the left ventricle can enter the systemic iota and blood from the right ventricle can enter the pulmonary artery now here you should remember about the two heart sounds when are the two heart sounds generated during the cardiac cycle one is referred to as the lub and one is referred to as the dub 
the lub and the dub sounds which are generated now the lub sound is the first sound that is generated by the closure of the cuspid valves and dub sound is generated by the closure of the lunar valves the semi lunar valves now you think and tell me when does the tricuspid and the bicuspid valve close now the cuspid valves close in the beginning of the ventricular systole why should the uh, cuspid valve close when the ventricles undergo systole the word systole means contraction here now the cuspid valve should close so that the blood does not go back into the atria now when does the semi lunar valve close now the semi lunar valve closes during the ventricular diastole that is immediately after the ventricle has undergone contraction it will start relaxing why should the uh, the lunar valves close during the ventricular diastole because the ventricle has pushed the blood into the artery and when the ventricle relaxes the blood should not come back into the ventricle to prevent the back flow of blood back into the ventricle during the ventricular systole what happens is the cuspid valves will close okay now cardiac output cardiac output is defined as the stroke volume into heart rate stroke volume means how much ml of blood your heart the specially your left ventricle is pumping into the systemic aorta per beat so with every heart beat your left ventricle pumps 70 ml but we want to know for a minute so in a minute how many times your heart beats that is called heart rate so if you multiply 70 into 75 approximately you will get about 5000 ml or 5 liters of blood that means your heart is pumping 5000 ml or 5 liters of blood every minute so the total volume of blood pumped by which part of your heart the left ventricle why are we concerned about left ventricle because the left ventricle is what pumps the blood into the systemic artery which takes the blood to all the parts of the body so every minute your heart is pumping 5000 ml or approximately 5 liters this is called cardiac output how did you calculate cardiac output you knew how much volume of blood is pumped by the left ventricle per heart beat so what is stroke volume stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped out of left ventricle each in each heart beat or cardiac cycle heart beat is nothing but cardiac cycle so with every heart beat you are pumping out 70 ml of blood into your uh, systemic artery systemic aorta and you need to know for a minute so you need to multiply this value with how many times your heart beats in a minute that is 72 you will get the volume of blood pumped by the left ventricle okay Uh, not in a uh, not per heart beat in an entire minute so cardiac output is the volume of blood pumped by the left ventricle each not each heart beat each minute and how did you take into account minute you multiplied the stroke volume with how many ever times your heart beats in a minute 70 ml into 72 m 72 times electrocardiograph you know that just now we discussed that your heart is made up of muscle fibers like uh, san avn bundle the bundle of his all of which are specialized muscles which generate electrical signals so by using a device called electrocardiograph you can obtain uh, a, a, a graphical representation this graphical representation is called electrocardiogram but the name of the machine don't get confused the machine is called an electrocardiograph and the graphical representation is called the electrocardiogram okay so this electrocardiogram has a wave pattern it has p q r s complex and t wave the p wave represents that phase in your heart a uh, cardiac cycle when your atria underwent systole so we shall write atrial systole 
and why did your atria underget uh, undergo systole because the muscles of your atrial wall were excited we call this excited state as depolarization so atrial depolarization then the qrs complex represents ventricular systole now you know that in ventricular systole the muscles of the ventricle are excited so ventricular depolarization and in the t state that is the t curve it is when the muscles of the ventricle undergo relaxation so when the ventricle relaxes we call it as ventricular diastole and when the muscles are in a relaxed state we say repolarization repolarization means they are going back to their relaxed state depolarization means the muscles are excited and always remember whenever the muscles are in excited state they will undergo contraction that contraction is called systole and when the muscles are in a repolarized state they will undergo relaxation and this relaxation is nothing but the diastole state okay so each of these waveforms you should know what it means p wave is atrial depolarization or atrial systole qrs complex is ventricular depolarization or ventricular systole t complex the t wave is ventricular repolarization or ventricular dis diastole now you know about the double circulation now double circulation includes both pulmonary and systemic circulation the part of the circulation which includes your lung is the pulmonary circulation and the blood being sent to all your body parts constitutes the um, systemic circulation now for systemic circulation you always start with the left ventricle from the left ventricle the oxygenated blood is pumped into your systemic aorta which continues as the dorsal aorta the dorsal aorta carries the uh, carries the fresh oxygenated blood to all the parts of your body and now see the color has changed that means the blood has become deoxygenated the deoxygenated blood reaches back to your heart which chamber of your heart the right atrium of the heart then the deoxygenated blood enters the right ventricle where you start the pulmonary circulation from the right ventricle the deoxygenated blood is taken to your lungs by a pulmonary artery and from the lungs after the blood gets purified or oxygenated the oxygenated blood is brought back to which chamber of your heart the left atrium of your heart through a vein that is referred to as pulmonary vein notice that even though it is a vein it is carrying oxygen so it is not called a vein or an artery because they carry oxygenated or deoxygenated blood it's called a vein because it brings the blood to the heart an artery always carries the blood away from the heart whereas a vein always carries the blood towards the heart so this type of circulation where there is a shorter circulation or pulmonary circulation and there is a greater circulation or systemic circulation is referred to as the double circulation so this is the pathway of double circulation in humans now you see the blood vessel if you take the blood vessel section if you if i were to draw this blood vessel section again obviously it's a circular structure because a blood vessel is a cylinder okay inside you will find a layer of smooth i mean uh, squamous cells flattened and bulged squamous cells you will find inside this is called tunica intima the innermost layer is called tunica intima outer to that you will find a coat of yellow elastic connective tissue and this coat of yellow elastic connective tissue along with the smooth muscles which are present in the wall of the blood vessel is called the tunica media and then the outermost covering which is uh, made up of a fibrous connective tissue is called so this is the outermost layer this is called the tunica adventitia and then the middle layer the tunica media which has smooth muscles and there is a coat of yellow elastic connective tissue and then the innermost layer which is made up of squamous cells is referred to as tunica intima notice that artery has a smaller central space called lumen whereas vein has a broader central space called lumen notice the wall of the vein is thinner but the wall of the artery is thicker okay and inside the veins if this is a vein inside the vein you will have valves because in the vein mostly the blood is flowing against the gravity or against the uh, contraction force of the heart and as a result from 
at regular intervals it must make sure that the blood doesn't go back and therefore there are valves inside the vein but in arteries you will not find any valves we already discussed that heart is auto regulated by san in our medulla oblongata we have a special center called cardiac center which works through a system of nerves in our body which is called the autonomic nervous system ans refers to autonomic nervous system autonomic nervous system has two parts sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system sympathetic nervous system is active when your body is facing an emergency situation and once the emergency situation has passed the parasympathetic nervous system will help your body to come back to a resting state so whenever you are uh, facing an emergency situation your sympathetic nerves are active you can imagine when you are tensed or emotional or nervous your heart rate increases and your heart contracts at a greater force and you will be producing you will be pumping more blood per minute that is called cardiac output and when you are in a relaxed state that is the parasympathetic nervous system takes over it will make sure that your heart beat becomes less per minute and also the speed of conduction of the impulses the electric signals generated by the specialized mass of muscle cells that we discussed they are also conducted very slowly and you also pump less amount of blood per minute so there is a fall in the cardiac output then adrenal hormones the hormones of your adrenal gland they are called emergency hormones adrenaline and noradrenaline they also have a direct role in increasing your cardiac output that is they will ensure that you pump more amount of blood per minute i hope by now you know the definition of cardiac output the definition of cardiac output is the volume of blood pumped by the left ventricle per minute which is approximately as we discussed about 5 liters Uh, or five thousand ml. Okay. Then the disorders of the circulatory system. There is high blood pressure. Normally, the blood pressure, the term for blood pressure that we use is how do we represent the blood pressure? That is one twenty by eighty. One twenty is systolic blood pressure, and eighty is diastolic blood pressure. Okay. Systolic means when your heart chambers are in contraction. and diastolic means when your heart chamber is in relaxation now in this measurement always remember that if your normal blood pressure if a person has a normal blood pressure it is 120 by 80 otherwise it can be higher than that for example if a person has repeatedly a higher blood pressure of 140 by 90 then it is considered to be a hypertension or high blood pressure then we have coronary artery disease in which you should remember there is a process called atherosclerosis coronary artery is artery that supplies blood so very important please remember here it is an artery that supplies blood to the heart muscles or the heart wall in the heart wall you have the heart musculature so the blood vessel that supplies the blood to the heart muscle or the heart musculature is called coronary artery in that we have something called atherosclerosis see what happens in atherosclerosis the normal uh, heart artery the coronary artery has lot of space for the blood to flow but now see in this artery there is deposition of calcium deposition of fat deposition of fibrous tissue so what has happened the wall has become narrow and this narrowing of the wall due to the deposition of fat fibrous tissue or sometimes cholesterol is referred to as atherosclerosis you can imagine if this is an artery which is supplying blood say for example there is a cardiac muscle sitting here and this blood wants this artery wants to supply blood to this cardiac muscle and this artery gets blocked like this because of atherosclerosis this blockage is called atherosclerotic plaque okay or plaque and then you can imagine the blood is not able to flow so less blood reaches the heart muscle so what will happen to this heart muscle this heart muscle will now start suffering from a deficiency of oxygen and it will ultimately it may also lead to the death of the heart muscle okay so this is how atherosclerosis is dangerous because it will clog the passage leading to supply of blood to some of the most important heart muscles which are present in the wall of your heart angina pectoris angina pectoris is nothing but 
a shooting pain in the chest suddenly the person experiences a piercing pain in the chest and this could be because some of the heart muscles are not receiving enough blood supply that could be because of again see there is deposition of cholesterol in the inner so it could be an early indication of a heart disorder okay heart failure is when the heart is not pumping enough blood it's not pumping blood effectively enough to meet the demands generally the person experiences a congestive heart failure where there is fluid accumulation or congestion in the lungs see the lungs have fluid pleural effusion has taken place there is swollen abdomen and there is lot of coughing and there is difficulty in breathing and the heart is not able to pump the blood against increased pressure in the lung and this condition is referred to as the heart failure heart failure is not the same as cardiac arrest please remember cardiac arrest is when the heart suddenly stops beating or heart attack when the heart muscle dies i told you if this is a blood blood vessel A, a coronary blood vessel and it is supplying blood to a heart muscle its job is to take blood to the heart muscle suppose there is a blockage over here then what happens the blood gets clogged over here the artery gets clogged and the blood doesn't reach the muscle when the muscle is not getting enough blood initially it suffers from oxygen deprivation but later the muscle itself dies and this death of the heart muscle these are as you all know the wall of the heart is made up of a special muscle that is called the cardiac muscle and this death of the cardiac muscle is nothing but referred to as the myocardial infarction or the heart attack again because the wall of the coronary artery which supplies blood to the heart muscle is blocked because of atherosclerosis okay cyanosis is a condition seen in newborn babies it may be because of a condition of a set of four conditions called the tetralogy of fallot sometimes there is no interventricular septum between the heart ventricles leading to mixing up of blood sometimes the valve is not closing properly there is stenosis stenosis means narrowing of the valve and as a result the valves there is backflow of blood and the body tissues are not getting enough Uh, oxygen sometimes the aorta is arising from both the ventricles or sometimes the position is changed systemic aorta opens from the right ventricle and pulmonary opens from the left ventricle and therefore the body is being supplied with deoxygenated blood sometimes the right ventricle becomes enlarged this enlargement of the heart is called cardiomegaly because of all these conditions there is no proper supply of blood or oxygen to the body tissues and therefore it leads to a condition called the blue baby syndrome where a tinge of blue or purple coloration appears on the skin of the newborn baby and then we discussed about myocardial infarction i told you that when the cardiac muscles are not getting enough oxygen supply the cardiac muscles will die correct and this death of the cardiac muscle obviously that part of the heart will stop beating because in that portion the cardiac muscles have dead and have died and this is referred to as the myocardial infarction and why does this happen because there is a blockage in the coronary artery and that blockage in the coronary artery is either a thrombus or a clot or it may be sometimes even inside the blood vessels a blood clot may be formed if the composition of the blood is altered um, because of say lot of fats in the blood or some other reason the composition is changed or the blood has become too viscous then it may clot inside the blood vessel or like we said there may be deposition of fat deposition of cholesterol deposition of fibrous tissue and such type of a plaque may not necessarily sometimes if you consider this to be the blood vessel i told you these are the blood vessels which supply to the wall of the heart they are called coronary arteries sometimes if a clot is formed or a uh, say a clot is formed at this place in the blood vessel it may detach it may detach from the wall and it may start swimming in the blood and it may get lodged elsewhere such a type of a mobile clot is referred to as embolism imagine if the clot gets dissociated from the wall and if it gets carried in the blood to elsewhere in the body such as the brain then it is very dangerous as it may lead to stroke as well so this kind of 
um, phenomenon where a clot or a plaque that is formed usually it is the clot it's called a mobile clot which is called the thromboembolism and such a mobile clot is referred to as uh, the um, embolus okay so this completes the chapter of uh, body fluids and circulation now let us quickly do a recap of the next chapter that is excretory products and their elimination you know that excretion requires elimination of waste material in the form of nitrogenous substances. Some of the waste substances are ammonia, urea and uric acid. See the classification of animals. Mostly we degrade proteins and nucleic acids in our body. We either release waste in the form of ammonia or urea and uric acid. Accordingly, we are called ammonotelic animals. Uh, ureotelic animals we belong to the category where our urine is principally made up of the nitrogenous waste that is called urea and urea is manufactured in our liver whereas if you see fishes they release their excretory products predominantly in the form of ammonia if you see birds and reptiles and land snails and insects they are called uricotelic because they eliminate their excretory waste that is their excretory waste is principally composed of a substance which is mostly eliminated in the solid form or the pellet form which is called the uric acid. So classification of animals based upon their mode of excretion it is either ammonotelic or it is ureotelic or it is uricotelic. Okay. The excretory structures and organs, primitive structures like protonephridia, advanced structures in earthworms and annelids, protonephridia is found in platyhelminths and amphioxus and very few annelids. Advanced ones like earthworms uh, possess structures called nephridia. Cockroach and orthropods, land orthropods like even centipedes and millipedes, they have malpe malphegian tubules. And then if you take aquatic orthropods like crustaceans, like prawns, then they have special glands called antennary glands or green glands which are meant for excretion. However, here we are concerned about the human excretory system. You know that we have a pair of kidney about 10 to 12 centimeters in length and 5 to 7 centimeters in width and see how the kidneys are placed opposite each other the outer surface of the kidney is convex and the inner surface has a cup shaped depression which is referred to as the hilus and from the hilus you can see the ureter a tube is coming out of the kidney which is the ureter or the duct which collects the urine and drains it into this muscular bag which is called the urinary bladder the duct which is coming out of the urinary bladder is referred to as the urethra there is a blood vessel called the abdominal artery which supplies the renal through the renal artery it is supplying oxygenated blood to the kidney and the renal vein will collect the deoxygenated blood and drain it into the inferior vena cava which takes the blood to the heart okay now if you were to take a section of the kidney the longitudinal section of the kidney you can see the following parts the outer area is called the cortex and inside where you can see these triangular structures is the medulla and each of these triangular structures is called the medullary pyramid okay and you can see that the cortex is extending between the medullary pyramid and these extensions of the cortex between the medullary pyramid is referred to as the renal columns or the columns of Bertini correct and then you can see that each renal pyramid has a narrow apex the apex opens into these funnel like structures which I'm showing now here so each pyramid is a triangular structure and then the narrow part of the pyramid opens into these funnel like structures and these funnel like structures singular is calyx so the funnels which unite together to form a broad chamber that is called renal pelvis and the renal pelvis continues out as the ureter and as you saw there is a renal vein which drains the deoxygenated blood from the kidney and a renal artery which uh, supplies oxygenated blood to the kidney. Now the structural and the functional units of a kidney are nothing but the nephron. The nephron is also referred to as the uriniferous tubules. Now the nephron consists of the glomerulus or a cup shaped structure which is sorry the cup shaped structure is called the Bowman's capsule and the Bowman's capsule encloses a tuft of capillary system that is called the glomerulus. The blood enters the glomerulus through the afferent arteriole exits the glomerulus through the efferent arteriole. 
there is a system of capillary network around the nephron and you all can see how the different parts of the nephron include the proximal convoluted tubule the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct correct and the henley's loop also is the hairpin shaped loop in the nephron which has a descending limb and an ascending limb very important to note is that there is a capillary network around the henley's loop and this capillary network is referred to as the vasa recta later we will be discussing about the importance of the vasa recta now this is the malpighian corpus cell or the malpighian body or the renal corpus cell see how the capillary network inside is organized this capillary network is nothing but the glomerulus and this double walled cup like structure is nothing but the baumann's capsule and the baumann's capsule continues into the tube that is referred to as the proximal convoluted tubule i told you that this glomerulus is a tuft of capillary what brings the blood to the glomerulus the afferent arteriole which is broader in diameter carries the blood into the glomerulus but the efferent arteriole takes the blood away from the glomerulus notice that the efferent arteriole is narrow so that more blood is entering into the glomerulus but less blood is leaving the glomerulus so obviously what will build up in the glomerulus the pressure will build up why the pressure will build up inside because you are pumping more blood inside but you are taking away less blood inside so blood starts collecting inside the glomerulus and that increases the pressure and this pressure that develops inside the glomerulus is called the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure and this is what is responsible for filtering the blood and this is a part of a nephron the first part of the nephron which are microscopic structures each kidney has about a million nephron please remember and in the nephron we are talking about the first part that is called the renal corpus cell or the malpighian body which has a tuft of capillary called glomerulus which receives blood through the afferent and it the blood exits through the efferent why the afferent is broader and the efferent is narrow is so that a pressure builds up inside which will help in urine formation so let us see how exactly the urine is formed let me first show you the baumann's capsule here so this is the baumann's capsule and uh, i told you that it is a double walled cup like structure so let me show this cup like structure now i told you that the blood is coming in through a broader vessel and the blood is going out through a narrow vessel so i have made it broad on one side narrow on the other side and then inside i told you there is a capillary system which is called the glomerulus the capillary is lined with flat layer a single layer of flat cells and this single layer of flat cells is referred to as the endothelium so what is this capillary network called the capillary network we called it as the glomerulus isn't it now this is a diagrammatic representation so i have shown the wall of the glomerulus as you all can see they are lined with a single layer of squamous epithelial cells and this single layer of squamous epithelial cells is referred to as the endothelium okay now what is coming in from this side blood is coming in more blood is coming in from this side and less blood is going on from the from the outside so when the blood comes in what is this broader blood vessel the broader blood vessel is referred to as the afferent arteriole correct or not and the narrow blood vessel is referred to as the efferent arteriole okay now once the blood has come in i told you that the pressure inside will build up and the blood will start getting pushed against the wall of the glomerulus and now in between these squamous epithelial cells there will be small pores through which the blood gets filtered okay so these pores are very very small and these pores which are present between the squamous cells are referred to as the fenestra okay so if there are pores which will allow the blood to get filtered but now can you all see between the glomerulus and the wall of the baumann's capsule there is a space now this space is filled with 
the connective tissue that is the basement membrane so let me label this as the connective tissue or the basement membrane and now coming to the inner wall of the bowman's capsule in the inner wall of the bowman's capsule you have special cells which have finger like projections on them see these special cells are referred to as the podocytes so these are present on the inner wall of the bowman's capsule and in between the podocytes also there are very very small openings now i'm drawing these openings are quite big but diagrammatically please remember so these cells which are present in the inner wall of the bowman's capsule are referred to as the podocytes and the pores which are present between the podocyte the openings are called the slit pores they are very very small but this is diagrammatic so now what happens the blood has to get filtered through through uh, to uh, through three layers what are they this is the first layer the wall of the glomerulus then i told you there is a basement membrane this is the second layer and then the inner layer which is made up of podocytes so when the blood gets filtered through all these three layers and also the slit pores which are so tiny that only much of the water much of the plasma except all the proteins and the blood cells will get collected in the cavity of the bowman's capsule so the liquid components of the blood that is except the blood cells and larger proteins why can't proteins and blood cells enter because remember the fenestra and the slit pores are very very small they will not allow the blood cells to pass through and this liquid that gets collected here in the bowman's capsule is referred to as the glomerular filtrate okay the liquid that gets collected here by the filtration of the blood that happened in the glomerulus and the bowman's capsule how many layers three layers what pores between fenestrae and pores between the podocyte which is referred to as the slit pores pores that is podocytes are located where inner wall of the bowman's capsule and the fluid that gets collected here which is free of proteins which has most of the water and ions and nutrients in the blood except that it does not have proteins and blood cells and this fluid is called prime uh, glomerular filtrate it can also be called as primary urine because it has both essential and non essential substances we should not call it just urine because urine is generally made up of only waste substances but this fluid that gets collected in the bowman's capsule has both essential and non essential substances so we call it as the glomerular filtrate see now the glomerular filtrate that got collected in the bowman's capsule will start flowing through the proximal convoluted tubule and then it will start flowing through this bent tube that is called the henle's loop and then it passes through the distal convoluted tubule and finally it drains down into this collecting duct which is present inside in the nephron so we now what we discussed here was this first part of the nephron in the previous slide that we discussed how the filtration happens in the nephron and notice there are arrows that are facing the nephron and arrows that are facing away from the nephron when arrows are facing away from the nephron it means that substances are being reabsorbed so it is called reabsorption things are being taken back because i told you the urine is made up of essential substances they are taken back into the blood okay now what about an arrow that is facing towards the uh, nephron then you can say this is called secretion secretion means things are being thrown into the urine from the blood so from the blood secretion is happening from the blood to the urine but reabsorption is happening from the urine essential substances are being taken back into the blood okay so here Uh, potassium is not reabsorbed remember potassium 
hydrogen and ammonia are thrown into the urine whereas essential substances like bicarbonate sodium chloride water nutrients like glucose amino acids which are very very precious are taken back into your blood in the descending limb of henle i told you that henle's loop is like a hairpin like structure so it has a descending limb and it has an ascending limb in the descending limb of henle only water is reabsorbed into the blood because the descending limb of henle is permeable only to water whereas the ascending limb of henle only salts are reabsorbed because the ascending limb of henle is permeable only to salts please remember Henle's loop is where minimum reabsorption takes place about 60 to 80% of reabsorption that happens here in the proximal convoluted tubule about all the electrolytes and water are reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule whereas in the Henle's loop minimum reabsorption happens especially in the ascending limb minimum reabsorption of salts takes place in the ascending limb and now coming to the distal convoluted tubule in the distal convoluted tubule essential substances like sodium chloride and water and bicarbonate are taken back into the blood and along with potassium and hydrogen similar to pct ammonia is also thrown in into the distal convoluted tubule and then in the collecting duct as you can see water is taken back into the surrounding tissue and then it enters into the blood small amounts of urea is reabsorbed which enters back into the ascending limb of henle so why this small amount of urea is taken we shall see that later now i had told you that in the nephron if you remember so this is the baumann's capsule this is the proximal convoluted tubule and then we have the henle's loop the bent part is the henle's loop the descending limb of henle and the ascending limb of henle and then you have the distal convoluted tubule and then you have this upright tubule which is called the collecting duct so we had discussed about all this right and in the beginning i had told you that the henle's loop is surrounded by a capillary what is this capillary that surrounds the henle's loop it is called the vasa recta all of you please remember the capillary surrounding the henle's loop is referred to as the vasa recta it carries blood in it now let us see the direction in which the urine is flowing in the henle's loop in the descending limb the urine is flowing down obviously and then the urine takes a turn let me show it inside only and then the urine starts flowing up so don't you think it travels down over here it travels up over here that's why it is called counter current downward current and upward current of urine flow similarly in vasa recta now where is the urine flowing in henle's loop urine is flowing from left to right but in vasa recta blood will be flowing in the opposite direction that is from the right to the left see this is the blood flow and where is the blood flowing the blood is flowing in the vasa recta why is this arrangement important urine flowing from left to right blood flowing from right to left now this we called it as the descending limb of henle isn't it and this we called it as the ascending limb of henle but shouldn't we call this the descending limb of vasa recta because the blood is flowing down so this is the descending limb of vasa recta and because the blood is flowing up we call this as the ascending limb of vasa recta it is opposite the descending limb of henle is facing the ascending limb of vasa recta the ascending limb of henle is facing the descending limb of vasa recta the first step of concentration of urine is we had discussed that lot of salts are absorbed na plus cl minus electrolytes like sodium chloride are reabsorbed by the ascending limb of henle so salts are reabsorbed then what will happen is the salt will enter the blood who is taking up this salt it is taken up by which limb of vasa recta the descending limb of vasa recta so now the blood will become heavily concentrated with salts and by the time the blood reaches the end of the vasa recta it is so heavily concentrated with the salt compared to the outside the salt concentration is very low so it gives out some of the salt back into the space between the 
two structures so salt is given back to the outside nacl 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 why it is given back because the blood concentration of salt is so high in comparison to the outside concentration and please remember this outside space is filled with a fluid we can call it as the inter stitial fluid okay in that fluid the salt accumulates now you can imagine the salt concentration here will become very very high and urine is coming down now this urine has lot of water in it and water as you all know please remember water flows from as a rule dilute to concentrated solution through a process that is called osmosis isn't it now the urine has lot of water in it so the urine inside the henle's loop is dilute but the outside has lot of salt so the outside is concentrated so now what will happen water will start flowing out from the descending limb of henle from dilute to concentrated and now this water which is very very precious is taken up by the ascending limb of vasa recta so ultimately all this is happening so that water comes out from the descending limb of henle and why is water coming out because the urine that is flowing in the henle's loop which part of henle's loop the descending limb of henle's loop is very very dilute whereas the surrounding has become concentrated because salts were secreted into the surrounding from the ascending limb of vasa recta so water comes out and that water is taken up by whom is taken up by the ascending limb of vasa recta so remember this part of the vasa recta is called the ascending limb of vasa recta why is it called ascending limb because blood is ascending in it why is this called descending limb because urine is descending in it this part of the henle's loop is called the descending limb this part of the henle's loop where the urine is ascending in is called the ascending limb so where is the water coming out the water is coming out from the descending limb of henle's loop so now we have another important uh, uh, kidney function that is called juxta glomerular apparatus juxta glomerular apparatus once i tell you this and i explain the pathway you will know what r a a s means now i already we already saw that there is a baumann's capsule correct proximal convoluted tubule then we saw there is a broader vessel and there is a narrow vessel yes the broader vessel is called afferent arteriole and this is the glomerulus now in the wall of this afferent arteriole there will be a special modified muscle cell in the wall of this afferent arteriole and this and one more thing is in most of the nephrons the collecting duct i mean the distal convoluted tubule will come to lie very close to the henle's i mean to the glomerulus so this will be the distal convoluted tubule so it's as if like see here if this is the baumann's capsule this is the proximal convoluted tubule and this is the henle's loop and then you have the distal convoluted tubule which comes to lie very close to the baumann's capsule so this is the so this part which i am showing you here is the distal convoluted tubule and this part which is over here is the baumann's capsule so this is why it is called juxta glomerular that means the distal convoluted tubule comes to lie very close to the glomerulus that's why juxta means it is adjacent and the dct is immediately adjacent to the glomerulus now here i will not get into much of the details but what you need to remember in this juxta glomerular apparatus where the dct lies very close to the glomerulus juxta means adjacent and to the glomerulus here in the wall of the afferent arteriole there will be a specialized muscle cell which i labeled and this specialized muscle cell is referred to as the juxta glomerular cell okay the juxta glomerular cell is also called the jg cell 
Now what this JG cell does is it will initiate a pathway that is called the RAS pathway. So let us see what it does. The JG cell is very very sensitive to a fall in blood pressure. So when there is low blood pressure the JG cell will release a hormone which also acts as an enzyme that is RE single N because in digestion chapter there is RE double N we had discussed. So this JG cell will release a hormone called renin. Now renin will act on a substance, a protein present in the blood that is called angiotensinogen. So this protein is called angiotensinogen which is converted by renin into another protein that is called angiotensin 1. Now angiotensin 1 will get converted in our system into angiotensin 2. And this angiotensin 2 is a very very powerful vasoconstrictor. What do you mean by vasoconstrictor? It can constrict our blood vessels. So when it constricts our blood vessels, what will happen to the blood pressure? The blood pressure will become normal. It will increase. So what was low will be counteracted. Did you understand? So this is called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Now this angiotensin 2 has one more job to do. It will act on your adrenal gland. It will activate your adrenal cortex to produce a hormone that is referred to as aldosterone. And this aldosterone will act on the distal convoluted tubule and it will help in reabsorption of sodium and water. And when lot of sodium and water enters into your blood from your nephron, then your blood pressure will increase. So what is the ultimate goal? Whatever fall has happened, it has to be brought back to normal by raising the blood pressure. So this system is called renin, R for renin, A for angiotensin, A for aldosterone system. Renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So which is the cell involved here? The JG cell which is present in the wall of the afferent arteriole. It releases a hormone called renin. Renin converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 itself will narrow your blood vessels. When your blood vessels get narrowed by because it is a very potent vasoconstrictor, you can imagine your blood pressure will increase. So low blood pressure will be counteracted. Angiotensin 2 also acts on a very important gland in your body, your adrenal cortex, to release an enzyme, a hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone will act on the distal convoluted tubule and stimulates the reabsorption of sodium and water into your blood. When more and more sodium and water enter into your blood, the blood volume will increase and so the blood pressure will increase so what is this a method to counteract a method to counteract low blood pressure okay ADH now ADH has a very important to play a role whenever there is low fluid volume in your body what is this low fluid volume in your blood in your body fluid and the ionic concentration in your blood say for example you are playing in the hot summer sun throughout the day you've been sweating you've not had water so what will happen to the water level in your body the water level will be low and this low fluid volume will trigger a, a part of your brain which is called hypothalamus and this hypothalamus will through a gland which is called the neurohypophysis or the posterior pituitary gland it will release 
a very important hormone called ADH or vasopressin. The full form of ADH is antidiuretic hormone. It is also referred to as vasopressin. So when is this hormone released? When there is low fluid volume in your blood and body fluids that is detected by your hypothalamus. The hypothalamus will release, will secrete this hormone but it is released through a structure which is below the hypothalamus which is your posterior pituitary or neurohypophysis which will release ADH directly into your blood. ADH is also a vasoconstrictor. It will increase your blood pressure because it constricts your blood vessel and it also acts on, very important, ADH acts on your collecting duct. Collecting duct of your nephron. It stimulates your collecting duct to absorb more water from the urine. So why should it absorb water from the urine? Because your body is deprived of water. And now you think and tell me when you absorb more water from the urine. So I am writing it here. It absorbs water from the urine. So you think and tell me will your urine become concentrated or dilute? The urine will be concentrated. So the urine that you eliminate from your body will be concentrated because some amount of water from the urine is taken back from the collecting duct into your blood. Who allowed this uh, reabsorption to happen? The antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. So it results in uh, production of urine which is concentrated. That's why it is called antidiuresis. Because all of you remember the word diuresis means producing dilute urine. But here it is the opposite of diuresis where you are producing concentrated urine because water is taken back into your blood through the collecting duct and that's why it is called antidiuretic hormone. Now micturition is a process where the urine is released from the urinary bladder. So you know that this is the urethra and the bladder is where the urine collects and then there is urethra to which the urine is eliminated. Now once your bladder is full, it will cause stretch in the wall of the bladder. So whenever your bladder is full, it will be stretched. The stretch signals are delivered to a region of your brain, which is especially the pons, which has the micturition center. And now the brain will send signals to your urinary bladder muscles. It will bring about contraction of the muscle of the bladder at the same time at the neck of the bladder you have a ring of muscles which is called the sphincter it will bring about relaxation of the sphincter so you can imagine what will happen when your bladder contracts the urine gets pushed down and when the sphincter relaxes this passage or urethra will open and finally the urine will be pushed out of the bladder it will be voided from the bladder and as a result this is referred to as the micturition or micturition reflex. So first there is stretch. The stretch is detected by the brain which will send signals, neural signals. The neural signal will result in contraction of the bladder but relaxation of the sphincter. Okay. Then analysis of urine is very important because sometimes if a person is suffering from diabetes, the urine may contain glucose. This condition where the urine contains glucose is called glycosuria and the urine contains ketone bodies is called ketonuria. Other than your kidney, your lungs, liver and skin also play a very important role. Your lung is capable of eliminating 200 ml of carbon dioxide. Uh, 18 liters of carbon dioxide 200 ml per minute or 18 liters of carbon dioxide per day and uh, your liver also throws out unwanted substances like degraded steroid hormones vitamins and drugs out of your system your sweat gland also eliminates waste like sodium chloride small amounts of urea and lactic acid and your oil glands eliminate waxes and sterols and hydrocarbons which are waste products in your body so not only your kidney but your lungs your uh, sweat gland and your oil gland or sebaceous gland also help in excretion. Disorders is when the kidney is not functioning properly. There is accumulation of nitrogenous waste material, especially urea. Whenever the urea starts accumulating in the blood, we call this condition as uremia. 
in order to overcome uremia a process called hemodialysis is carried out see how the blood is being collected from an artery and it is being pumped into a system where there is a cellophane tube it is a tube made up of semi permeable membrane so the tube is surrounded by a fluid which contains uh, which does not have any urea in it so you can imagine from the blood all the urea enters into the surrounding liquid which is called the dialysate and by the time the blood reaches from the other end reaches out of the other end the blood has become pure because much of the urea has escaped into the surrounding fluid and this blood is again released into the vein of the patient so literally you are collecting the blood passing it through a tube of semi permeable membrane allowing the blood to rid itself of all the urea into the surrounding fluid like i told you this fluid is referred to as the dialyzing fluid or it is referred to as the dialysate so all of you remember that the dialysate will take up all the urea why is the urea flowing from the blood into the dialysate because in the blood the urea level is very very high since in this person the kidney is not functioning but in the dialysate there is absolutely no urea so therefore what happens is from higher concentration to lower concentration the urea diffuses out from the cellophane tube which is a coiled tube that you see in inside which the blood is passing into the surrounding dialysate and so if the kidney are not functioning normally then it is referred to as renal failure all the excessive urea gets accumulated into the body and uh, uh, also most importantly kidney plays a very important role in maintaining homeostasis and internal balance none of it is performed if the kidney fails and as a last resort if dialysis is also not an option then a functioning kidney can be used for transplantation presence of kidney stones which are made up of calcium oxalate which may be present in the renal calyx in the renal pelvis or in the ureter sometimes in the bladder or the urethra as well is referred to as the renal calculi mostly the ones found in the kidney are called renal calculi and then there may be obstruction in the ureter there may be severe pain radiating the pain is called as the renal colic and sometimes there may be infection of the glomerulus of the kidney and that infection of the glomerulus of the kidney is referred to as glomerulonephritis it may be because of growth of certain bacteria such as streptococcus and how does one know that there is a problem with glomerulus probably when you take the urine sample the doctors or the diagnostics uh the diagnostic uh, lab may find that there will be a lot of rbcs in the urine of the person and that indicates that yes there is something wrong with the glomerulus which is probably infected with streptococcus and probably the pores i spoke of in the glomerulus have become wider because of bacterial activity and even the blood cells are passing into the baumens capsule remember when the blood gets filtered the filtration is so fine that it is called ultrafiltration because only what and essential and non essential substances pass proteins and blood cells do not pass but here proteins and rbcs may be detected in the urine of the patient telling the doctor that something is wrong with the glomerulus which could probably be an outcome of infection so this completes the synopsis of two chapters that is body fluids and circulation and excretory products and their elimination thank you